We're closing in our last week in the desert, Brad. Yeah. How's it been going down there? It's it's warm. Is like a good warm or a it's been warm up here, which has been nice because, you know, San Francisco in the summer is usually awful. 24 seven fog and 50 degrees. Yeah. Cold. But but I could see living in the desert. Maybe warm is not such positive all the time. Um, th- Look, there are pros and cons. The main pro is that we have air conditioning here. So like when it's really hot, then we just turn the air conditioning on and come inside. Also, the air conditioning is on all the time. Yeah. Are you are you going to be able to give up air conditioning? I mean, I don't have a whole lot of choice. Um, uh, yeah, I know. But man, <laughs> that might have been the single hardest thing about moving here from the East Coast was no more air conditioning. I don't mind it about nine months a year when we're into fire season, like the constant threat of a heat wave combined with bad air. And the fact that then that means I'm going to be cooped up in the house with three people breathing the same air for like two weeks sometimes. Mm-hmm. And it'll be 90 degrees, like the walls will be 90 degrees within a couple of days of that. <laughs> yep. Sure it's does. not good. Yes. It's not what you want. Flashbacks to three or four different times last summer. Yeah. No, last summer, like th- I'm here now because of last summer. Like we literally were like, let's leave during the bad time so that we don't have that problem again. Yeah. I was super skittish about it this year, but it's been way less bad in the city than it was before. Well, luckily the wind has been blowing the right way. Right? Yeah. Like we just got lucky with the wind, right? It's not like there were fewer fires. Like in fact, I think the biggest fire to date happened like a month ago, right? That didn't affect us. The wind blew the other way. I t- eat it. <laughs> East coast. Cannot say that out oh, loud. Sorry. That's not, no, <laughs> we don't know about that. No. Okay. It's a fire. fire. Look, we're all anti-fire here. Just to be clear. I shouldn't have made a joke. I apologize. Fires are no good for anyone. Well, no, actually, that's not true. Like controlled, natural, like naturally occurring fires actually are like critical, right? Like, isn't that actually critical for the kind of boom and bust vegetation cycle? Having been to the Living Desert Museum in Palm Desert, California this morning, I can tell you that. Am I about to learn something? Yeah. Fires are incredibly important for a large number of ecosystems. In fact, Mm. Uh, some lots of plants don't uh, germinate. Their seeds don't germinate unless they're exposed to the cleansing power of flame. Boy, that's um, grim. Including the mighty redwood. So, uh, yeah. Well, those hang around for a while. Hopefully we can, we've got time to make those up. They have to have fire to burn, grow new trees. That's what German, you know, like the seeds have to have the fire. And then once the fire grows and they can grow. No, I'm just saying we have time. Hopefully redwoods will be around for a little bit. The ones we have, unless they burn. I mean, but they're, they're pretty fire safe. Like, like generally speaking, like the, they're, they're, they're built in such a way that like the fires can go all around them. And usually like the undergrowth burns out of the redwood forest. And then the, the most of the trees are left behind. Um, but yeah, no, uh, the living desert museum in Palm desert, California was super cool. And I highly recommend it. It's kind of like half zoo, half botanical gardens, um, and we saw, we saw like, Af- we, they have like African Australian, uh, North American deserts represented there in terms hmm. of like wildlife. And I don't think they have plants from the other places for kind of obvious reasons. What kind of fauna are we talking? Uh, I saw, I saw quokkas. I'm sorry. A quokka. A quokka is like a, it's a marsupial from, I think from Australia. I didn't read the plaque there. Uh, we were in a pen with some wallabies. Ooh. Like you just get to go into a sealed area and the wallabies are just chilling and they like, they walk right by you. Well, they kind of hop. They don't really walk. Friendly wallabies. They were they wallabies fucking rip. Wallabies are awesome, man. Not the ferocious kind. Uh we got to see some uh African wild dogs, like painted dogs. That was really cool. Uh, and we we got to talk to the keeper for them for a long time and she told us all sorts of cool dog stuff. Like they're really cool animals. Animals, it turns out, are cool. We should we should do things to save the animals and the plants. I fully agree with you. Also, it sounds like being at the zoo superior to not being at the zoo. I'm gonna I'm gonna go and tell you. Like we got up early and we're there at like 820 probably like they opened at seven and we quickly we were like, why the hell does the zoo open at seven? We immediately realized why the zoo opens at seven because it was 110 degrees by 10 o'clock in the morning. You mean, you mean, you mean this zoo in particular? <laughs> yeah, this zoo opens early and it closes at one for for like uh, safety of the guests reasons. Boy. We got to Gina. There was a the mountain lion, the, like the California mountain lion was or, or cougar, as they're called in some places. Uh, they she was just kind of chilling up against the edge of the cage and looking at us. And when people would walk by, she would snarl and show her teeth and pin her ears back. Yeah. And it, like, that's the thing that I never want to see without a couple of inches of glass between me and, and one of them. Like a giant house cat is a terrifying concept. It turns out my grade school mascot was a mountain lion. There was a stuffed one in the lobby of the grade school. Wow. 
Like right outside the pathway into the principal's office, actually. <laughs> you don't want to get on the bad side of that mountain lion. Sometimes hard to tell whether the mountain lion or the principal is worse. <laughs> Welcome to Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod. I'm Will. I am Brad. It may surprise you that I remain myself. 106 episodes. I'm yeah. always shocked. <laughs> Every week I'm like, you're thinking like, oh, maybe somebody besides Brad will show up this oh, week. Man, thank God it's Brad again. <laughs> There's really somebody else. Wow, that's very flattering. Oh, this is a, it would be exhausting to have to like do the whole 100 episodes again and be like, ah. Oh. That could have gone very much the other direction of like, oh, thank God it's somebody as anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends whether you're a half full or half empty kind of guy. Um, <laughs> I mean, it probably tells you a lot about my psychology that I'm just like, oh, thank God he still wants to work with me. Um, I got to warn you, I'm a little bit moist right now. I, Ooh, I literally yeah. just jumped out of the pool. Oh, that's good. Moist. Yeah. That's not skeezy Damn, moist. Better. I don't know. It's not. Yeah, it's not like a gross moist. Uh, but I'm definitely I'm in the I'm definitely in the napping time after oh. the, the hot the the sweat walk <laughs> this morning for five hours. No better time to record a podcast than when you're ready for a nap. At one point, I went into the bathroom and I like I had my sun hat on and I just put it under the sink and got it soaking wet and then put it right back on my head. And I was like, oh, that feels so good. That sounds amazing. That's- it was very hot. What's your uh, what's your drying off process? Just a straight up cloth towel. You got any kind of space age moisture wicking material going on? Look, the relative humidity is like half a percent in a <laughs> given moment outside. So I just <laughs> T-pose for about 45 seconds and I'm good. Don't make it five steps from the pool before you're bone dry again. If I put the towel more than about 20 feet from the pool, my skin is dry by the time I get to the towel. And I just have to de- de- dry off the hair and beard, basically. Dude, I got I to gotta check out Palm Desert, man. All of that sounds like a nice change of pace. It's... it's um. Like I think we're gonna make this a regular a regular thing we do. Like this yeah. is this has been a really fun like it's it's kind of weird because like normally when you go someplace on a vacation or even like like this is working vacation because she's doing school I'm doing work and all that but like usually I feel compelled to go do a bunch of stuff yeah totally but the combination of pandemic and weather means that I, a I don't want anything to do with anything inside so that is like ninety percent of the things we would do here. Uh, and the rest of the stuff is knocked out because it's 110 degrees. So basically, we just like hang out at the pool and we've done like three outings and it's it's been really good. It's been really yeah. nice. Like how many how many trips have you gone on where you felt like you could just lay around doing nothing? You know, like like you said, like it feels like you're wasting time if you're not going, 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 seeing stuff every second. But like going to a place and just doing nothing sounds pretty well, great. But it's it's also kind of freeing to just do your normal stuff. Or well, that's in, what I mean. Yeah. After 18 months, like doing normal work stuff in a room that's not the room I've been in for the last 18 months. It just smells less, less duded in here, which is really nice. <laughs> yep. The humidity helps with that. Yeah, the humidity does definitely help. It's like, you know, it's uh, uh OK, you should cut here. I was trying to make a joke and I couldn't make it happen. Yeah, no, it's okay. but you know what? Actually, <laughs> just leave it in. Oh, you, God damn it. Give him a peek behind the curtains. Oh, you know, I'm the one who needs the nap. I was trying to say something pithy and like the neurons would not connect properly and it just did not come out. But we're, we're recording at a novel time of day because I took the day off. So, um, yes, I was trying to I was trying to think of a more and less comparison because the less is the number of monitors you have more relaxation, fewer monitors. That's the there oh, we go. Man. Not having a bunch of mo- like I'm, I miss my monitors. That's that. That is honestly like my bed in the and having one extra monitor are the two things that I miss. <laughs> Wait, is, you don't everything else bed? I could don't, leave. Don't have a good bed in there. The, 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 it's all Ikea mattresses. I miss I, I miss the look. I'm not going to talk about mattresses on this podcast unless somebody pays us. Oh, so, fair. Extremely. Fair. Yeah. I, you know, I, I will. I will badmouth Airbnb, though, and say that somehow not surprised that an Airbnb proprietor would skimp on the mattress quality. Um, like 
if I had a place that I rented to people on Airbnb, I would do exactly what these people do. Oh, that's They've that's done what it. I mean. Like the kitchen's outfitted really nicely. The it's, it's nice furniture. They have like reading lamps and stuff beside the bed. I got no complaints. It's fine. All right. Except for the lack of monitors. Should we tell this is my favorite one of my favorite weeks of the month? Yeah. It's it's Q and A month. Yes, it is conversion week around <laughs> yes. here. Yes, we are, as always, turning your questions into our answers. That's right. It's going to crank these cues through our patented process. Do you put like two quarters and a cue in the machine and you crank it out and then an A comes out the other end? Yeah, it's like when you go to the Fisherman's Wharf and you put the penny in there and you kind of, you know, you turn the thing and it's, it's, it elongates it into an oval. It prints a little, the pretty little sailboat on there. That was precisely what I was referring to. Yes. They, ha- they always have those machines at zoos also. So in front of mind. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> where, episode, where, if people the, have the Q, I'm sorry, the Q and A episode is the smushed penny of podcasts. <laughs> if people have cues, mm-hmm. uh, can, okay, can, we, can we talk about the smush penny is a federal crime, right? You're breaking the law in a major way when you do that. You're, you're defacing legal tender, right? Isn't that basically what's going on there? That's not legal. I'm surprised in this our litigious time that the smush penny machine people. Like uh, an upstanding establishment like a zoo or or a, a, a penny arcade is allowed to do the smush penny machine. I think that the, the, the Secret Service would crack down on them. All right. Here we right from uscurrency.gov. Oh, hold up. This is the Google thing where it's serving it up to me and I can't read the whole thing. Oh, here it is. No. Uh, crimes related to U.S. currency. Good Lord. There's a lot of them. Number two. Yeah. Second on the list. Defacing U.S. currency under Section 333 of the U.S. Criminal Code. Quote. Whoever mutilates, cuts, defaces, disfigures, or perforates, or unites or cements together, or does any other thing to any bank bill, draft, note, or other evidence of debt issued by any national banking association, blah, 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 with intent to render such bank, blah, 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 shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than six months or both. So you're saying when I let my eight-year-old mash a penny today... That she could go to the big house for until she's 14? That sounded like that was just paper currency. Bank bill, draft, note, or other evidence of debt. That sounds I like mean, paper a penny's only, evidence right? of debt. I guess. Yeah, take a penny, it's, leave a penny. I don't know. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, currency experts around here. Also, question answering experts. Secret Service came and yelled at us at Maximum PC once because we what? put pictures of real money in the magazine, which you're not allowed to do. What? What? You're, yeah, you can't put pictures of real money in print. You have to. You have to. It's a bizarre restriction. You have to yeah, fake it. You, you had to put fake money in. We learned that when the Secret Service came and yelled at us for a little bit, and then they were like, "Hey, don't do this again." We're like, "We're we will not do this again, sir." I apologize unreservedly. All right, it's going to tie this whole conversation together, and then we're going to get to the questions. I was okay. scrolling. I was scrolling around Google Maps as one does mm-hmm. of one's surrounding environs. And yes, learning about the world around you is always good. Did you know that the San Francisco kind of, I don't know, office outpost, whatever you want to call it, of the United States Secret Service is right up by Fisherman's Wharf? It's like two, three blocks away. <laughs> fucking watching the penny rollers. I mean, that's man. right. That's right. They're just waiting to pounce, man. You just watch yourself up there. Watch you. You, know, you put that 51 cents in, you mash your penny. You better be ready to run. Alcatraz is right there. They can just chuck you right out there. You'll never, never see your family again. Nope. Think about it. They don't even staff that thing anymore. You'll be left to your own devices out there. Uh, good luck eating the lichen. Yes. Okay. Questions drawn from the Q&A channel on our Discord. And also, mm-hmm. theoretically, yes. people who have... If, if people, So there's an important... Uh, somebody, pointed, Trimantha, pointed out uh, this week. The mechanics of the Q&A channel are such that if you should not post private things in there. Because other people who are in the channel at the exact moment that you post that question will be able to see whatever personal identifying information you post in that channel. So if you want to do that, use email. Uh, I believe yes. the email address is techpod at content.town. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Trimantha. That is a hot tip. I didn't even think. Of. Yes. I mean, so I knew about that. That is an unfortunate kind of artifact of the way Discord works, that the messages don't become hidden from you until you log off and back on and then they all disappear. But yeah, if you were looking at that channel when somebody types something in there, you will see it. So be careful what yeah. you put in there. Don't uh, confess to murders. Don't do murders. <laughs> mm. uh, I also put a warning in the like MOTD on the channel. So hopefully people will read that. Anyway. Great. Great. Shall we begin? I think so. Uh, question here from runner Matty. 
when does the week start? Monday or Sunday? 100% Sunday. Wow, really? Like, hmm, that's the right answer to me? Yep. Like, for for some like completely abstract arbitrary reason, like for, for like for no particular reason at all, Sunday, but Monday functionally. No, it's Sunday functionally. The end of the week is Saturday. The start of the week is Sunday. It's very simple. We learned it in grade school. Functional uh, Saturday and Sunday are barely distinguishable from each other in terms of what you're doing. Like the, they are the weekend. <laughs> is Sunday not part of the weekend? Look, when you're when you're a parent. Saturday is soccer day. Sunday is doing shit around the house day. I just, I can't, I'm never going to get past this labeling thing. Like Sunday is part of the weekend, like which (laughs) according to the name is the end of the week. But, but the weekend is also the week beginning, Brad. Mm, Okay. Yeah. Like we're going to get into weird temporal nature of time stuff here. This is a, this is a, this is a conversation really I was going to say we need Craig Nelson, but we need Daniel Craig, I mm. think, to to weigh in on this as the ultimate arbiter of what is or is not the weekend uh, might be the right answer. Started to make me bring up that article you sent me about the third thermodynamic nature of clocks. Look, all we need is an infinite amount of energy to generate enough entropy and we'll have a perfect right. time piece. Yeah. But you know, there's what is it? Is There's an inverse relationship between information and entropy and in, uh, in terms of how accurate a clock is. The weird thing about clocks from that article. Yeah, disperses entropy, the more accurate it is, it turns out. So therefore, it's it's weird to me that the only way to measure time is to create entropy, though. Right? Yeah. Like that's that's I mean, I guess that's that's what they Okay, we should explain. So the article was somebody like 10 years ago was like, hey, you know, nobody's ever figured out what actually clocks are. Like right. how they work. Like what is what is like at a quantum level? I think this was kind of from the view of quantum mechanics, right? Yeah. And and like how you measure time, because like we have really accurate, incredibly ridiculously accurate clocks that are like that measure the vibration of cesium atoms and stuff like that. But but there's a point at which you can't make them more accurate because we can't measure the vibrations more uh, uh, for smaller things. And and then you get into quantum realm and and Ant-Man becomes involved or something. Uh, The upshot of this article was that they were theorizing increasingly complicated ways to make clocks that are more and more accurate than your cesium atomic clocks. And this is when they realized that there's actually a formula for this. And the formula is basically entropy up, energy down, energy up, entropy up, accuracy up. Yes. But, you know, I I guess if you want to burn a couple of supernovas, you can have a really accurate timepiece for a few minutes. Yeah. Um, yeah, the upshot is it sounds like the, all that theory and research, uh, resulted in some, what they described as like foundational thermodynamics equations, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like the, the other physicists looking at this work were like crazy excited about it. Uh, well, and, and, and what it might, that will and what be it might lead to. to quantum computing and right. stuff like that. Right. And, and also <laughs> not to get too heady here, but also reconciling, uh, general relativity and, and quantum mechanics, which traditionally have been completely incompatible. Like, this is the I, challenge of being a three-dimensional creature I know. living in a world where time flows Dude, from uh, seriously, past to present. Fuck linear time, man. Fuck causation. Can we I, just get a physicist in here? I want to know how to traverse the dimension of time back and forth. If I could just go back a few years, I could maybe fix a few things. This is going to be the longest question and answer episode ever, but I watched the first episode of Deep Space Nine the other day. It came up after I was watching something else. And he goes into the wormhole and meets mm. the fourth dimensional, the wormhole, you yes. know, the, 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 the prophets, prophets, yes, I believe, who are four dimensional, you don't, you know, who, who, who see the, who live in the fourth dimension, right? That it was a very good explanation of what we're all talking about. Interesting. Here. I don't, I mean, I haven't seen that episode since I was 16, I think is when that show came out. But I, I did at the time I was not acquainted with theoretical physics enough to, to pick up on that. That's cool. Yeah, it went right over my head, too. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, we got another question. Thinking, sorry, thinking about this is weird, heady interstellar stuff as well. This is the last thing I was going to say. We really need to get a physicist in here. I, I, thinking, I, we can I'm make sorry. that happen. Thinking thinking about the, the, the fourth dimension of time as being a, you know, as a higher dimension, higher dimensional being would experience it as a physical dimension that could be traversed back and forth, right? Mm-hmm. Thinking about it that way, like in a sense... That doesn't that imply that everything that is going to happen has already happened? Well, uh, it's maybe not that you can traverse back and forth as you see it all at once. So the same way that we can see depth on a three-dimensional object, right? we don't perceive 
that axis as as growing over time, we perceive it all as happening. You know, growing as we look at down the dimension, we perceive it all at once. Sure, a four, yeah. fourth dimensional being, fifth uh, higher dimensional being would presumably perceive the what we perceive as time in in that way too. Right. Uh, anyway, I physics hope, is weird, man. I, I hope I hope I'm not taking the wrong lesson from this, or sound like I'm high or something. But like, it kind of makes me feel a little bit better about making mistakes because, in a sense, like, kind of it's already happened, right? Well, I mean, that's a that's a philosophy question. Do we have free will or? Yes, of course. This yeah. straight, I, straight up getting into predestination and yeah. determinism type stuff. I, this is where I always kind of, I didn't get the math here, so I tuned out. Yeah. You know what I do tune in for, though, is turning Q's into A's. That's right. Let's read more questions. Number two. Uh, question, question from, <laughs> sorry, this episode is a real mess. We should never record at this time again. Uh, Voltage X writes in, what's the fastest internet connection you've ever used, including both upstream and downstream speeds? Oh, I've been. My answer I'm, is super yeah. boring. Yeah. It's, it's the home internet connection I have right now, this gigabit up and down fiber. Do Wait, I didn't that? CBS have some baller oh. internet? No, oh, that's, well, yes, at the time, it absolutely was astonishing. I mean, but even that, like, I would speed test occasionally just to see how we were doing, and I never saw it more than like five to 700 megabits. But was down. it, but N, so NC State was on internet too, right? Oh, I don't know. I mean, the, so the well, I'm not super familiar with internet. So I'm sure some research. I mean, that's a, a huge engineering school. Like, I'm sure some somebody research was. department yeah. somewhere in there was connected to that, but not certainly not to the dorm. I mean, this is revealing my age. When I went there, the dorm I ended up in was one of the three remaining dorms on campus that had not been wired for Ethernet. Oh, I fucking went to college and moved into a dorm and didn't get the good Internet. I still had to use dial up. So I went. <laughs> I moved out of dorms the year that they wired dorms at UT. Okay. Um, so th the boring answer is that it's, I've never had faster than gigabit because yeah. I've never had, I mean, the internet that I was connected to may have been faster when I worked at the university in the, in the, in the department I was, did have high end connections for the people that needed it. Yeah. But the main network was like hundred base T at that point. It wasn't, it wasn't. Like so we we had a lot of machines that were still on uh, ten base T coax the the BNC connectors sure uh, in ninety eight or ninety nine whenever that was so I mean it's not yet gigabit up gigabit down at home it turns out pretty much the best I've ever been exposed to yeah I mean it's not an exotic answer but it is notable that our home internet is now the fastest internet we've ever had right like that's a good sign of progress to me well. And it's interesting because it's a it's one of the places that the standards have kind of lagged because like gigabit has been around for almost 15 years now, 15 or 20 years, like in not not around. It's been around longer than that, but like widely available in consumer hardware for a really long time. Yeah. And it's only now that we're starting to see a need to go beyond that. I mean, Comcast is starting to sell uh, greater than two, like two, two to five gigabit services for consumers um, there are some ISPs in like Chattanooga and places like that that are offering 10 gigabit yep. to businesses. Like it's, it's, I kind of don't know what I would do with it, but I'll take it. That's I, guess. The, I mean, we've talked about it, but that's the beautiful thing about running all this dark fiber, right? Is that the fiber itself can go way faster than a gigabit. It's just, they don't, they don't have the other equipment deployed to make it happen yet. But the hard part is running the lines and that part's done. So I wonder, I wonder if there's a time when I'm going to put a ethernet card in my computer again. As opposed to, oh, wait. Like using onboard. Oh, you mean to get something faster? I thought yeah. for a second, I thought you meant you were going to go Wi Fi on your desktop, which what? No, thank you. I'm okay. doing that right now. It's awful. <laughs> thought I knew you. Um, no, I'd, I'd, I'd rather not. I'd, I have done exactly that. I mean, thanks to, thanks to a very generous uh, member of our Discord, I have got a 40 gigabit connection between my PC and my NAS currently. How are you saturating? You're saturating the hard drives in the NAS probably, right? Oh, not even. I mean, yes, yes. Uh, that's the bottleneck. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, although it's been weird messing around with like Windows. Like I cannot, I mean, you're familiar with iPerf, mm -hmm. the, the little network uh, throughput benchmarking tool. Yeah. Like I can't even come close to saturating 40 gigabit even with iPerf, which theoretically will saturate whatever you're aiming it at. Like I top out at like 20, 25 gigabit, which like, yeah. granted, not so bad. But, you know, different operating systems, different TCP IP stacks, different networking layers, et cetera, et cetera. Like it, there seems to be a lot more in that equation than just what the hardware can do. It's it's um it's it's it turns out it's when you have multiple potential bottlenecks, things get really complicated. Yes, for sure. Um, 
Anyway, the, I, the thing for me about having 10 gigabit is not trying to push one t- uh, 10 gig download. It's being able to do anything you want and never worry about hitting a ceiling, right? Like, like Steam downloads, Battle.net downloads can saturate my gigabit, right? Yeah, Origin, Battle.net, Steam all will saturate me. Right. But imagine getting like the gigabit, gigabit and a half that Origin or somebody is willing to serve you and still having all that other headroom to never have anything slow down or bottleneck. Like that's the that's the use to me. Yeah, it seems pretty good. Seems like more speed would be good. Uh, question from Caleb. Why don't they sell USB-C hubs with more USB-C ports? Like I hadn't really thought about it too much until I read this question, but I realized like they do seem kind of stingy with USB-C ports on everything. They just want you to buy adapters and daisy chain constantly. <laughs> And that kind of sucks. So there's not um, the problem is right as of like a year ago, just before the pandemic, we were supposed to start seeing uh, chips that allowed like the, the, what, the chip that is required to, to um, uh, multiplex USB-C didn't really exist. It started to come out. Intel made is making them and is selling them. Um, but the products haven't evol- uh, emerged as fast as you'd expect. There are a handful of USB-C hubs. The other problem is that there's two categories that look at almost identical from a from a, like a user perspective. One is the Thunderbolt dock. Thunderbolt is a protocol that lets you access PCI Express lanes over USB or DisplayPort cables, I think, or, or, or special DisplayPort cables. And the Thunderbolt, you can get Thunderbolt docks that will have more than one USB-C port. And you can also get monitors that have Thunderbolt uh, that use USB-C Thunderbolt as the display interface instead of DisplayPort or HDMI. And then they might also have an additional Thunderbolt USB-C port that you can use to connect a second monitor to your to your daisy chain. The problem is, uh, and then you can also buy docks. You can buy Thunderbolt docks that will have multiple ports and, and those will let you like use those for your laptop or something. So you can hook up a monitor or two and, and some USB ports in your printer and whatever to your laptop when you plug in at work. Um, it, it's it's weird to me that there aren't USB-C hubs with more USB-C ports. I think probably part of the problem is that USB-C, since it's also a power delivery mechanism for a lot of people, like it, it, I think the problem is it does too many things. It's power delivery, it's display, and it's like, data slash utility. So when you're doing all three of those things, there's not one product that's going to do everything you want. Like the Thunderbolt hubs will do the monitor, but might not do power. The the USB hubs will do data, but not power or monitor. And it's going to be really confusing to consumers, which is why I think we end up with the dongles and the adapters and like the USB aid is like my audio interface is a USB C plug on its end. And the cable it came with is USB A that just is like 3.1 and power. It's like 3.0 cable with that does power basically, and and a little bit of data. So it's the 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 long answer. The solution to your problem is probably that unless you're doing Thunderbolt and need monitors, or you're doing power to charge a laptop or something that's a high draw, you probably want a USB A to C that's the right spec. Because you can get like a 3.0 or 3. I think you can get a 3.1 even, but I'm not sure about that. You can definitely get a 3.0 cable that is USB-A to USB-C, and that's probably the right answer for for your particular problem. I am increasingly of the mind that USB will never be good. I Look, we're both old enough to know what it was like before USB. Mm-hmm. It was bad. Yes, right? I mean, it's better for sure, but like... There's there's a difference in my mind between good and good enough. Like it's good enough, but it's not good. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a. It's not the problem is it's not it's not good. It's it's not simple. Like well, no, that's that's part of what I mean. It's like it's if if there's too much friction in the experience of figuring it out and using it, that's it's not good enough or it's not well, good to me. And there's I a mean, lot of friction. So this is the this is the thing that annoys me is when it was three different cables, you wouldn't think you don't think anything about having to have a DisplayPort cable for your monitor and a USB cable for your for your audio interface and a power cable for your power on your laptop. But when they unified all those things in one cable, they we all like I thought it was going to make it much easier and much simpler because we just use the same fucking cable for everything. And that has absolutely not been the case. Um, and, and that is that is the failing, I think, is that it it we, we all expected it to reduce complexity and it and it actually just made things 
much more obtuse because all of a sudden you have like it's like the oculus the wire the wired oculus link cable situation where you have a cable that is physically the right thing and when you plug it in it doesn't work because electrically it's a usb b instead of a usb or usb 2 instead of usb 3 or whatever so those damn consortiums look they just need to get their shit together they mean well they can just never seem to agree on the right things i mean there will be a time in the future when you can buy a USB C cable that will do everything you want. I think. Okay. I think we're just. I think it's just. It's the normal. I mean, we we are like nine years into USB. Like Norm and I saw our first USB C connector in like 2010 or 20, 2011 or twenty twelve. I think. And I, I remember distinctly flipping the like looking at it, <coughs> flipping it over, looking at it, flipping it over, looking at it, flipping it over me like the plugs in both ways. <laughs> It's very exciting. We like it was weird because it was at CES. It was one of those one of those like big like uh, it was like a hotel ballroom that they sell people like 15 by 15 foot booths to and a bunch of people who didn't want to pay for a full CES booth set up in there. And we were so excited. We were the only people the USB guy was so excited to talk to us because we were literally the only people there the entire night that was excited to talk to them. I was like, this is. It's all press. And Dude, what is not pre- to be excited about with a reversible USB cable? That's what we said. That's the dude. Okay. Well, that's why we do this podcast, I guess. At the same time, yes. it is astonishing to me that they made a reversible plugs in either way USB cable and then found another way to make it even more confusing. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I think realistically, I think moving the port, the power stuff. Like, I think... Taken separately, I think each of them is a good thing. I think moving the the power stuff to USB C is a good thing. I think taking the Thunderbolt stuff and moving that off of DisplayPort and onto USB C is a good thing. I just, I just, it's just not like the messaging around it is bad. Yes. Anyway, for sure. Yes. It's it's a, that was a very USB thing to do. Yeah. That's so USB. Let's take this thing that we have that's perfect and then put everything into it and make it bad again. Thanks, USB. Yep. Uh, let's see here. How about it's kind of, I almost brought this up during the, uh, cold open, but instead yeah. I will give, I will give Shags Magoo his moment in the spotlight. Mm. Did you know that to start a new zoo in the United States, you have to have at least one grizzly bear, one brown bear and two black bears. It's the bare minimum. Thanks Shags. Uh, thanks. The only reason I actually put this in here. We have to have at least one dad joke per episode. I'd actually, the reason I put it in here is because I wanted to talk about this because I was looking it up the other night, even though it's not really tech related at all. Yeah. I found it on the internet. That's the tech angle. My girlfriend and I, for for some reason, wanted to look up what to do when attacked by each type of bear because I knew the, I knew the instructions are different per bear. Yeah. And this is going to test my information recall that I'm already forgetting which is which, but... Grizzly, you make yourself as small as possible, yes, right? Yes, grizzly and brown, you want to go prone on the ground. That's the, there you go. There's, that's the, that's the mnemonic. Grizzly and brown, go prone on the ground. That's good. You want to lie on the ground, legs spread, and I believe hands over your head. The, what you're trying to do is make it hard, as hard as possible for the bear to flip you over. Yeah, you don't want it to be able to get to your soft intestinal parts. Right. Um, and I think generally what they were saying was you want to go prone like that and hope that it leaves you alone. Yeah, it seems like a real iffy strategy from where I sat. <laughs> Hope that it loses interest is essentially what they were saying. Yeah. Um, whereas I want to say with the black bear, you're actually supposed to flee. Like you want to just run. Yeah, the black bear, the black bears. I've seen black bears when I was backpacking on the East Coast. They are. Yeah, they're chill. It sounds like it sounds like they've got their line as well. So the the place that you the thing I was told in as a Boy Scout learning about backpacking in that area is that if you see a black bear, the only time you're going to be in trouble is if you're between a mom and cubs. Okay. And if you are, if you, if like the line, if the bear thinks that you are in the line of, of contact between the, the cubs, you're going to have a real bad time. But other than that, which is, I think why you run, I don't know. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's, that's fair. I mean, this, this guy did allow for the worst case scenario of a black bear is after you and wants to eat your ass. And it was very much like, do not engage the bear. Get the hell out of there. Like, get to a high place, climb a tree. Bear, they can climb trees. Oh, I know. I know. They were saying it's like climb up. It's up high in a place where the bear can't get to you is what they were trying to say. Yeah. But the really disturbing part is that in all cases, the end of the instructions was if none of these other things work, essentially fist fight the bear. 
Like they straight up said, like hit the bear in the face and hope that it discourages it and makes it leave you alone. And like, is, I kind of figured by the time you get to the point where you're boxing the bear, your luck has run out, but you tell me. Yeah. This is like the surfers. I know that are like, yeah, if you ever see a shark, just bop it in the nose, man. That's, I'm like, no, that, no, oh, no, no, oh, man. Thumbs down. Don't fight bears. Bears will mess you up. Um, you want to do a little kind of around the house homemaker sort of block? Do a, you know, a, a segment? Uh, are we doing a special? Red will around the house talking about housewares. Ooh. Yeah, housewares such as. Well, I'll read the question from Arcade Sage. What's more important to have in your kitchen, a kettle or a toaster? Kettle. Yeah, I would have traditionally said toaster, but we just finally got a nice little thin necked. What is that? A gooseneck? Is that what you a call that? A gooseneck kettle. It's so nice. Like a very nice, fine temperature control electric kettle, like a good one. Yep. Yep. And Which I one did you know. get? Do you remember? I don't, I don't remember the brand. Okay. It was one of the top rated Amazon ones. Bona for Vita. Oxo has a good one. No, that was my understanding. It's not. I'm familiar with those brands. This was not like a brand I had heard of, which okay. means it may be rebadged from some generic factory. I don't know. Oh, that's fine. But it's been working well so far. Um, I, I love for, for coffee making, for tea, for like even for stupid stuff like making like proofing yeast, like getting yeast ready to make bread or, or whatever uh, is really nice. Temperature having, control kettles. Awesome. Yes. Yes. Having having exact hot water on demand in, in moments is pretty good. Uh, at the same and, time, I like, I like to toast things, but like the toaster, we bought the toaster that was recommended by the wire cutter at the time, but I have not been thrilled with it. So maybe I just need a better toaster. I, maybe I toasters are a, not good. I had me. a Breville, like the Breville robot up down one that somebody gave us when we got married, I think, uh, that was awesome. It was really, really good for a long time. It conked out last year. Oh. I haven't missed it. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. We got, we replaced right. it with an air fryer slash toaster oven. And like, I'm going to go and tell you, I kind of wish we just didn't. And I put the toast on top of the gas burner and let it rip. I feel yeah. like, I feel like I could do that. I feel like I could make that work. If, if you have gas, that sounds like a good way to go. We, we yeah. do not, sadly. Minor fire hazard, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just got to watch it. Toast is pretty good, though. I'm not going to lie. I love toast. We we got some thick wheat toast while we we're here. It's really been really nice. Some desert toast. Get English muffin toasted. Yeah, desert toast. All right. Question from Badfinger. When Brad said he had to vacuum every week, even with a RoboVac, I was shocked by his adamant tone. How often do you clean your bathrooms? Sundays. That's why wow, that's really? it's the start of the week. Bathroom well, cleaning day. <laughs> yes. It's the ancient Greeks knew it best bathroom cleaning day. We f I find we have to vacuum a lot because of the dust. Because yeah. of no central central air. Is, does that make dust worse? I guess I hadn't considered that. I mean, the HVAC system has a big filter on it. I guess that's true. Uh, yeah, I mean, I yes. I have I have thought forever that dust the, the dust in our apartment seems way worse than it should be. And maybe that's why. I think also urban areas, you get more like soot from cars and stuff. Like our, we used to live, Ugh. when we used to live by the freeway south of Market, like next to DNA Lounge, we used to get this black, sooty crap on the oh, on gross. the windowsill that was gross yuck yeah. yuck but yeah usually every week sometimes we sometimes i skip one i, I i'm i'm the bathroom cleaner in our you're house. the designated bathroom cleaner yeah i don't like doing the tub so i do that I, the tub is definitely every other week but like I'll, I'll hit the scrubbing bubbles on the tiles once a week and and clean the mirror and the sink and the and the toilet sure cleaning the bathroom is a point of contention around here I kind of like cleaning. Like there are some things I have to do, such as vacuuming. There are other things that I'm like, oh, I could probably go a little longer. So the thing for me about the bathroom is like if I have to choose. So I also do the stove just because I'm good at doing the degreaser stuff on the on the stove top. Yes. And our, our, we yes. use our stove a lot. Cleaning the stove is another one I enjoy. So I like doing the bathroom because it's like it's gross. It's it's like uncomfortable. Gina also has back problems and I don't. So it's much easier for me to do a lot of that stuff. OK, that's a good point. Um, but like, I'd much, I'll always take the distasteful thing that takes less time than the thing that is like more time consuming, but less gross. Sure. If we're divvying up chores. That's noble. No, that's just me. Like, I like rather do something <laughs> like, you know, I can min max my bathroom cleaning using, using it to your logistical advantage. How, how often do you clean your bathroom? Hold on. Let's, we, we didn't get to the bottom of no, this. No, no, no. Let me, let me, let me clarify here. 
it gets cleaned on a frequent basis. Okay. How often I am the one doing the cleaning is, is where the contention arises. Well, I think the you is the plural in this case. The, okay. The, oh, yes. The, okay. The, house, the housekeeping team at, yes. at each of our domiciles. In, in, that, in that case, it is about a, a weekish. It's just, I don't know. I, 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 much like you, I choose to do other things instead. Uh, our rule... Our rule on housekeeping is that if one of us has what the other one feels are unreasonable expectations about cleaning mm. things, it's their problem. Like, for example, one of us feels that the sheets should be replaced and cleaned much more often than the other one does. Mm -hmm. So it's their problem and not, I see. not the other person's. Okay, that's kind of where we're at then. That, sound, that sounds like a... Kind of standing rule of if you want it done sooner, then it's up to you. But you, but you can't. You can like you can kind of get dangerously close to evil with that, though. That's that true. Could just be like that a cop true. out for like I don't want to do shit. Um, I don't know. I I feel like you use with great power comes great responsibility. Yes, on that. for sure. Uh, speaking of living in a city, yes, hot times. Question from Roland Stazek. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about why you both still live in the San Francisco area? Do you intend to I, remain there for the foreseeable future? He's got a little bit of an anecdote here. As someone who recently lived in the expensive D.C. metro area, but moved to Vermont just over five years ago now to escape housing prices and endless commutes, among other things, I can't believe I waited so long. Now I live mm -hmm. in a... Are you sighing? Yeah, <laughs> now I, this all now sounds I, real good. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, we'll... Yes. Now I live in a still reasonably populous area where housing prices are more reasonable and where friends and coworkers will say to me with a straight face things like traffic was so terrible. It took me 25 minutes to get out of Burlington. Are you still in San Francisco because you love the area, the culture, your partner's jobs aren't as portable as yours or something else? If you have the chance, I highly recommend selling a small and not that great house in a big city suburb. I wish I even had one of those. <laughs> And moving to a more distant area and spending half as much on a house that is twice as big and three times as nice. I just, I, th I think you can rest assured that we have both thought at length about this exact question. So the time for us to move was probably a year ago. For Just because I have a, my daughter's in third grade and like we're to the point now that I like, if we don't do it soon, we, we have, we're stuck here for a fairly long time. I look at the tax rate in California. I look at the amount of house I can afford. I look at the number of places I want to live versus the places I can afford to live. You know, I don't know. I'm probably, we're on the edge, I would say. Yeah, I, think I'm, I am kind of in the same spot. I mean, my my partner's job is pretty tied to this area. So that yeah. is a consideration for sure. But also like it's only, it's only been in the last you know, since the pandemic started, really, that the remote work has become so in vogue and like we've we have largely been decoupled from physical location. Right. Honestly, the thing that worries me about moving someplace like Vermont is that if if I did move to Vermont and then needed to get another job at some point, I'm afraid that the job situation for somebody that does what I do might not be sufficient. Like sure. I, I might I might have to just move back, which would suck. Sure. Because like the, the one thing I do know is that if we sell our house here, there's very little chance we'll ever be able to buy anything here again. Right. Right. That's kind of that's um, another consideration wherever you're going right now, because the housing market is so completely buck wild. Right. Buck, buck wild. Like, yeah. like, like, I don't know if there's any end in sight on that. Well, I mean, I think there's going to be some regulation, but there's some real skeezy business happening in the real estate market right now nationwide. So the, the other side, the other the other side of it is that right now, if we move. We're not going to be able to get like we will not get a house that is twice as big and three times as nice for half the money anymore. Yeah. Like we will we will spend a 25 percent less and get a house that is bigger and nicer. But it is not a hey, our million dollar house here turns into a five hundred thousand dollar palace someplace else anymore. Right. Yeah. Unless we move someplace we probably don't want to live. Yes. Like even, even the housing prizes where I'm from have. Yeah. Like all but all but doubled since the last time I looked. If there had been a like Vermont is totally on our list though. It, like, Interesting. It seems appealing from both a climate change and a place I would like to live perspective. I there is a lot I would miss about San Francisco though, the culture and particularly the food. I mean food, yeah. Like honestly, when I go to grocery stores on the East Coast, I'm always bummed out. California grocery stores have kind of ruined me. Of course, I haven't been in a grocery store in a year and a half, so maybe it doesn't matter. Yes, truly one of the truly one of the great food cities. Yeah. 
Um, this is sort of housing-ish related from Kyle. Okay. What do you do with the boxes your electronics came in? Oh, which do you keep and which do you throw away? Until recently, I kept the box for most of the electronics I purchased over the last few years. I've never needed them, but for years resisted throwing them away in the off chance I would have a reason to have them. I never have. Recycle it all. Yeah. It's cardboard, man. Just let it return to the earth. Um, I, I get it. I used to be a chronic. You might be surprised to find out. I used to weird be a, a habitual box keeper. Um, but apartment living completely cured me of that because you cannot. Like, you just cannot store things like that in apartments. So they are gone. My PS5 and Series X boxes have been gone for months at this point. I keep boxes for things that I might. So for a while, when I was having to ship computers for VR stuff, I would keep like case boxes. Um, and I kept a couple of monitor boxes that I actually need to go find in the garage and recycle at this point. Um, we, uh, I kept a big TV box for a little bit because I wasn't sure if I was going to keep it. And that felt weird. Um, but yeah, get, get rid of boxes. You that's, that's, that. that's, you're right. That is the one exception. I've got boxes for my PC cases and my keyboard, like piano keyboard and like a couple of other yeah. big things that I would, I would want to move and I would not want to trust to just move without protection. So, but even those like flatten. Yeah. And realistically, you're going to pay for movers probably if you move again. Right. Yeah. I often think that I would probably rent a car if I were moving like a, like an Outback or something with a lot of cargo space yeah and just do a bunch of trips like my not a bunch but it, it, like just the pcs just basically the things like my nas like things that are of like sentimental value my boxes of old video games from childhood like yeah the bare minimum of things that i absolutely could not stand to see get lost or broken uh and drive it there myself and let everything else go in the movers gina and i always haul a couple of loads of keepers like the special stuff and yeah like like houseplants fell in that as well for a sure. long time, right? Yeah, like, they're they're members of the family. Yeah, they count. Um, yeah. but yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I would do. I think I I am I like I'm so I am so cutthroat about like get, like getting rid of stuff that you can just buy again on the other end. There is that that I that I actually think about using one of those storage pods if I ever move. Like the just they drop it off outside, you load it, and then they just drop it off wherever you're going. We did a storage pod for a little bit to move stuff to send some stuff. Uh, um to send some stuff from the East coast to here, send, send some furniture with my, from my parents to here. And it worked really well. Like, okay. like the trick is it has to be packed super well. Uh, we also, the, when we moved into the current house we're in, we actually paid for pretty good movers. Like instead of the normal two guys in a van, ultra cheap, whatever budget movers, we paid for people who packed everything up and like, they did a better job wrapping up like TVs and stuff than I would have. So, okay. That's good to hear. Um, I've just, I've yeah. heard so many horror stories about movers, but I'm sure there are good ones out there. Well, it's the, it's the normal thing of like, if you get the person who bids the least and you're not really lucky, then you might have a bad time. Yes. That That's makes sense. Experience. Do you have any idea how much those storage pods get tilted back and forth? Or are they kept pretty level? I think they're pretty level. They're on a okay. bed truck usually. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. Wondering how much stuff tipping over is a problem with those things. We also, when we had to do a reflooring a few years ago, we put one of those in the driveway for a month or two to and hauled everything out of my office. And um, we had to refinish the floor in there for reasons. And uh, that was, it was like, it was super convenient to not have to clear enough space in the garage for all the shit that lives in my office. And uh, we just emptied out the room into that thing and then put it all back in when the floor was fixed. Sounds pretty handy. Okay. Yeah, it was good. Last kind of homey question here from Yasserg, I guess is how you say that. Oatmeal or grits? Oh, man, they're both. I can't pick. Oh, really? This makes me a terrible Southerner, but I would say oatmeal anytime. So uh, honestly, since I started making both in the rice cooker. Ooh. Oh, dude, did you not make grits, grits in the rice cooker? Oh, I've never made grits in the rice cooker. That sounds oh. pretty good. So you put them in the night before and put like a little bit of butter in there. Damn. And then like the normal kind of porridge amount of water for your rice cooker. And they come out so freaking good. Okay. Um, I love grits. I love like grits with a fried egg and maybe some bacon chopped up in there and a little bit of chopped onion or something. Oh, yeah. Just I mean, stir it all up. Oh, yeah. Cheese, so cheese, cheese grits. Oh, quite yeah. Damn good. I mean, my grandma, God rest her soul, used to make red eye gravy. We put on the grits. That was just, yes, chef's kiss. But 
I don't know if it was something about the way my family always made grits that they can't be out for more than like 20 minutes before they just become this like congealed rubbery mass that you can just pick up with your hand. No, that's just what grits. That's that what just, happens with grits. Just, is that just grits? That's okay. the cycle of life. Yeah, that's a that's a big turnoff for me. They don't last very long. At, at the same time, like if you were asking about rolled oats, rolled oat oatmeal, I would send that just fire that shit in the sun. It's the worst one of the worst foods in the world. But the steel cut stuff and even like the steel cut with a little bit of the yes. rolled, rolled in there. You're the one that taught me that trick and it's been you, fantastic. You just throw a little handful of the rolled oats on top of your big thing of steel cut and you get a little bit of an extra creamy thing going on. Yep. Yep. It's real good. Yes. Steel um, cut oats are fantastic. I I find them to be very versatile. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. If I had to pick, I think I'd probably go with oatmeal and then I'd just substitute polenta in for grits. Okay. And not tell anybody. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Life finds a way. Yes. So it does. Let's see. We got a lot in here. We don't got a lot of good questions this week. We might have to take some. We've got a patron episode coming up next week. We might have to take some more of these on there because. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. If you don't like that, I should say I'm going to stop myself here. If you don't like that, if you prefer we not do more Q&A's on the patron episode, please let us know. Yeah. I hate to I hate to double dip uh, if people aren't into it, but we get a we have an embarrassment of riches in the q a channel in terms of good questions so we can't even even with two episodes we couldn't get to half of these so um can we do julian's question about the batteries I oh yes that good. was yes that was on my list julian wheels has a question how do you manage nim batteries like in a loops as they age wait as someone with a kid i'm sorry nickel metal hydrides sir. yes i come on this isn't the secret of NIM. That's why I say it that way. Every time I see that, oh, it just makes me think oh. about the secret of NIM and I can't help myself. Okay, okay, okay. Excuse me, nickel metal hydride. Uh, as someone with a kid, we have dozens of AA and AAA batteries, and I have no idea which ones might be lower capacity at this point. Their website says you can charge them 2,100 times, so maybe it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like, the thing is, um, what we do is we have a... Big giant collection of the white and loops, which are the 1500, the 2100 charge cycle mid power ones. The things that I need to last for a long time, like flashlights and stuff like that, we buy the slightly more expensive, fewer charge cycles, but higher capacity ones. And those we know we only put in certain things like flashlights. And um, sometimes I put them in Xbox controllers, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> uh, the when they stop working, you'll know we had we had some tested after years and years and years, like some of the ones we inherited from the whiskey offices in on Front Street that Vinny had bought in like 2010 conked out in like 2014 after thousands of charge cycles. And, wow. they, and they eventually they just stop holding it. They just stop charging. Like you put yeah. them in the charger and it's like in the charger is like, yo, dog, these aren't going to work. And then uh, we recycled them. So you guys just recharging those things like daily almost. Uh, sometimes, yeah, we used them in the battery in the in the wireless packs. Oh, OK, and sure. At tested, we used a lot of wireless packs. So. OK, yes, yes. You would not be sitting in a chair in front of a TV for most of your recording stuff like we were. No, yeah, no, we would have we like even in the shop, we would use wireless packs usually because it was easier than having to deal with cables in there. Right. Um, I, For what it's worth, the only ones that I've had at home die in normal home use after I think I think we wrote about these in 2010 first. Um, is when I started swapping them out. I've only had the ones that I accidentally stole from work die. So uh, my slightly less technical solution is that I bought um, kind of different color variety packs. Yeah. So which makes them easy to pair up so that I at least I at least know that every two every pair of double A's has been in use together for its long the whole time I've had them so that I know that I don't have like one good battery and one older battery mixed together, which might be bottlenecking the capacity. Well, you got to be careful, though, because the on the end loops, at least the different colors are different capacities. No, this is just a this was a fun variety pack of their like oh, spark, oh. sparkly colors. They're like maybe for kids, probably. And they're like purple and orange and green. Uh, I think Vinny's strategy was to when he bought a new batch, he would put a different color, little dot sticker or piece of piece of gaff tape on okay. each one. Yeah, that works, too. And that worked pretty well. It was weird because the blue ones used to be cheaper and lower capacity. I mean, the, the thing is, for kids' toys especially, it doesn't matter because if they wear out faster, you literally just go get another one from the drawer and put those back on the charger and it's fine. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I, don't worry about, I don't worry about it too much. Yes. Um, let's see. You want to do one more? Yeah, let's do one more. Ooh, okay. This is I like this one. It's from Bolt Breaker 1. 
What are your thoughts on using M disks for data storage instead of a NAS? Oh man, M disks are so stupid. Um, wait, you, wait, you know what an M disk is? Oh, this is very exciting. <laughs> yeah, it's the these are the these are burnable CDs, but instead of using an organic dye layer, they use like a stone amalgam that that you can that basically melts into pits and lands. Right, that's what it is. It's stone. It's a stone-like amalgam, is what? what they described it as. Wow. So they're up to Blu-rays now. I think they, I'm not sure if they have BD100, but they definitely have 50 gig ones. 25 and 50. I don't know if they have dual layer. I think they only have 25s. Uh, you might be right. I, I'm not sure. I could go look. <laughs> okay. So here's here's the thing. Do you remember when CDRs came out and they were like, hey, man, these are going to last 100 years. It's the perfect, buy the gold ones. They're, they cost a lot more, but mm -hmm. they're going to last forever. Mm -hmm. And then these, then we did that again and again and again. And here we are with the latest generation of this is going to last a thousand years. And guess what? You have really buried the lead here, which is that they claim these, these Blu-ray writable discs last for a thousand years. Like that's, yeah. that's the tagline. <laughs> so in 20 years, when you've burned a bunch of shit to these discs, a here's the double, here's the two. Well, first off, NASA's and M discs are two totally different are solutions for two totally different problems. Different use cases, for sure. Yeah. NAS is not like, a backup. Like, like RAID is not a backup, and NAS is not a backup. It's a convenience device. I saw somebody put it really well in our Discord the other day. RAID is not a backup. RAID is for uptime. That's exactly it. A drive failed, and your thing is still going. You can swap that drive out, and it's back to full resilience. But in the meantime, it stayed up, right? But it's not... You should never depend on a, an act like a live NAS as your only backup solution. You definitely want to have another fallback. So um, the thing about the thing about the M disks is that they do, they do like heat cycles. They do light cycles. They do all sorts of different stuff on these. And then somebody looks at how long they have, like what horrible things they have to do to these disks to get them to not hold data reliably anymore. And they make up a number that is like a thousand years at that point. And it's, it's a number that looks great on a box so that when you're buying the really expensive burner, you're like, oh, man, I should get this one that burns the rock disks. That sounds awesome. Well, so so the compatibility is shocking. Like the, the random $50 Blu-ray drive in my PC right now can do them. Like the, they are compatible with like most of the writable Blu-ray drives on the market. Yeah, it's it's I, I just don't trust them. And also, t even if they're even if they're up to 50 gigs now, 50 gigs is not no data. So I, you're, you're not wrong. So they they do. I'm on Amazon right now. They do have 100 gig ones now. BDXL. OK, uh, which made by. Ver so they're about 10 bucks a piece. 100 gig disc is roughly ten dollars and change made by verbatim. So it's at least like a known brand. OK, uh, 100 gigs. I have uh, my NAS is 14 terabytes. So uh, one four zero 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 divided by 100 is 140 discs. So that's only fourteen hundred dollars to back those up, and probably like six weeks. Yeah, totally. You're not going to back up your NAS with them, but 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 those old those old disintegrating VHS tapes of our you know the last forty years of home movies that my parents had digitized, like those will fit on one of those hundred gig discs. So here's an interesting thing you can do that's free though too. You can uh -huh. also just put them on YouTube and make them unlisted, uh, and then they're just there and uh, you don't have to worry about you it. Know, who knows if YouTube is going to be around forever? I think. Look, Brad, Google makes a buttload of money on YouTube. I think YouTube's probably fine. Probably. Look, 10 bucks, burn some important sentimental stuff on there, throw it in your fire safe. For, for yes. For the important sentimental stuff, yes, 100%. I might do a trip report here. Okay. For that, for that price, I might give it a shot. Just, just a little, little extra peace of mind. I just put my computer in a case that doesn't have an optical drive for the first time in like uh, the last 30 years. Never. Never. Um... I can't, I don't know. I think I'm probably fine. Actually, I mean, honestly, the thing I wanted to say about these is my concern is not the disc wearing out or becoming unreadable. My concern is all of the drives disappearing that can read them like I mean, 30, 40 years from now, the disc might be useless because you might not be able to find a drive that's still working enough to read it. Right. Or even if you have a drive like like, OK, so CD-ROMs are forwards compatible with DVD and Blu-ray, which has turned out to be really convenient. Because if it hadn't been, where are you going to find a motherboard with a PATA port yeah. that you can plug in? Like you can you can still buy kind of adapters that plug into USB and will bridge USB to PATA, which which means that you could still use those drives. But like it won't be too long before those things are not accessible anymore. Yeah. 
Yeah. And and the interfaces, the drives, is a, a whole host of problems. Just keep copying it from hard drive to hard drive. What, like, what do you think? Like maybe 10 years out from getting hard to buy an optical drive? I think we're probably closer. I think the SATA ports going away is probably going to be before that, but I could be mm. wrong. You know, there's a lot of USB adapters out there, to be fair. There are a lot of USB adapters. I mean, maybe maybe the tech is ubiquitous enough at this point that it's not a problem. All I know is that if I want to buy a VHS-C adapter to capture uh, uh, stuff off of VHS tapes in my VHS player, they are shockingly expensive now. Interesting. Because the camcorder conked out like 10 years oh, ago. Yeah, sure. And uh, the, the, the VHS-C adapters are like 50 bucks when I looked last time. And I don't know that I... Like, I'll probably just borrow a VHC camcorder from somebody to do that copy that's, at some point. That's the way to go. I've been eyeing yeah. a uh, an IDE to USB adapter for a while. Yeah, I have one of those. Do you? Yeah, oh. they're really useful. Yeah, all those old hard drives in my parents' basement. I wouldn't mind dumping those just to complete my I, <laughs> complete my lifetime of data collection. I used it to look at all the hard drives that are in the box in my garage. And when I was like, yeah, I can probably just thermite all of these. They'll be fine. Yeah. Uh I'm going to throw one. Well, this may not be fast. Bonus question. One bonus question in. A little, little follow on to the homemaking segment. It's from uh, one of our networking gurus uh, from the frozen north of Canada, Cake Batter. Beans and chili, yes or no? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, this instant easy answer for me, which is yes. So, yes, the traditional culinary answer is that no, there is no, there are no beans in chili. That's just a sauce, man. I, what is that? It's just, if that's you've ever had like just, a real th- thick, meaty Texas chili, that's just meat gruel. Have you ever been, have you ever been to the Texas chili parlor in, in Austin? I have not. All of my business trips to Austin were dominated by barbecue, probably for good reason, but. Uh, the barbecue is pretty good. The Texas, Texas chili parlor, uh, we went to one time when I was there for South by, and, uh, this was before death proof. I'm sure it's a nightmare to get into now, but, uh, it, like I kind of became a convert on that moment. It was a, it, it's a, it's a good chili. Like it's a, it's a wholesome filling experience. I was delighted. My taste buds were overwhelmed. It was everything I expected from chili and all the beans do is absorb flavor. Plus, mm. If you're going to put it on a hot dog, which is yeah. the like God tier use of chili, you don't Absolutely. want beans on your wiener. So you're <laughs> you're definitely right about that. But again, I, th- I think of that as a sauce. The Texas Pete that we bought that we put on hot dogs for my entire youth said chili sauce right there on the can. But you were Texas. We were Hormel. No beans people. No, we were Texas Pete. Sometimes stag if, if things were thin. My dad had very particular tastes about certain things. One of them wow. was hot dog chili. Another one was hot sauce, which was Texas Pete. You know, when I was a kid, I thought that if a product was named after a state, then when it was only named that if you're outside that state. <laughs> so like I thought that Arizona iced tea was called Tennessee iced tea when you were in Arizona. Uh, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Think about it. Tennessee Pete. So yeah, very Will centric, Will centric view of the world, I guess. Um, All right. I think that's a good place to wrap it up. If you have questions, you can submit them in the patron only discord to the Mm -hmm. Q's seeking A's channel, or you can send them to the email address, which is. (laughs) Yes, I know what it is. You want me to say it? Yeah, why don't you say it? It's techpod at content.town. Techpod at content.town. That's where people can send emails. That's right. It is techpod at content.town. I did this bit the other day on a work on a work video. Oh, yeah. Um, Uh. And as always, if you want to get access to that patron-only Discord, it is a wonderful community full of delightful human beings where Brad and I spend a shocking amount of time hanging out. Um, uh, you can find out how to sign up at patreon.com slash techpod. Uh, we've, people talk about bears a lot. I don't know exactly. I missed the origin of the bear conversation. Oh, is that where that question came from? I assumed. Cert- certain topics just kind of take over the Discord briefly here and there. Y- yeah. Yeah, we we've enabled threads in the last since last we spoke, I think. We've allowed mm-hmm. a handful of I'm it's audio so you can't see me. I'm air quoting trusted patrons to uh join the thread club. They can make new threads. Yes. To kind of lightly corral conversation. We've put the power of the threads in the hands of the people or at least a small selection or of the people. A subset. Yeah. We I mean, look, we're I think that I think we accidentally made it all Canadians. Also, I'm not sure about Wedge. <laughs> not intentional. But I know at least 
Uh, two of the three thread thread uh, club members are Canadian. Yeah. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's it's been uh, it's it's a lovely community, and you should come hang out there if you like the podcast. You will like the folks that are in there because they all like the podcast too. Yes. Um, and a lot of they like a lot of other stuff too, and you can talk to them about it and learn a lot. Yeah, exactly. And have, and have a good time. Um, so. Uh, again, the address is patreon.com slash tech pod. If you can't sign up the Patreon, just tell a friend, let people know about the podcast. That's the way we get new folks in here. And, and we love to have new audience members all the time. Yeah. Uh, this is the part of the show where we thank a lot of patrons, Brad. Oh yeah. Cause it's the end of the month. We thank oh, our yes. associate producer tier patrons and our executive producer tier t- patrons. Uh, so I'm going to start. With our, uh, our executive producer to your patrons, Andrew Slosky, uh, Fractured Veil slash the Paddle Creek Games Company, makers of such wonderful games as Fractured Veil, uh, David Allen, Jacob Chappell, James Kamek, Joel Krauska, The Bunny Fiend, and Twinkle Twinkie are at our, exe- are at our executive producer tier. And then Alejandro Navarro, Andre M. Burke, Arthur Geese, Brian Rabe. Dan Brockman, Dave Yulian, Graham Banks, Jad Rita, Jason Neeland, Jay Maybe, Jorge Pereira, Josh Klein, Julian, Mike Bell, Ryson, uh, Sanchik Kumar, Terry Cox, Thomas Shea, and Wedge are all associate producers here. So thank you all so, so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you to all of our producers. Thank you to all of our other patrons. Thank you to everyone who listens. As always, as we always say, it's a 100% listener supported show. We don't, we don't take ads and uh, you know this is this is this is what pays the bills over here and we we really do appreciate it yes uh and if you want to find out how to join again it's patreon.com slash tech pod i think we'll be back uh next week there's a patron episode coming up probably over this weekend would be my guess maybe early next week yes in the coming days we got to do it before i drive back next wednesday oh, right thing. we gotta yes that's some overhead to plan around logistics we gotta pl- plan around my nonsense uh, I'm, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm not super looking forward to the drive back, but mm. I think we might drive up the coast instead of coming up five, so maybe Ooh. it'll be more fun. That sounds nice. Yeah. As long as you can make it in one day. Yeah, I am not staying in a hotel. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. We'll sleep in a car on the side of the road. It'll be fine. Pacifica or bust. Exactly. Have a lovely, lovely week, uh, everyone. We'll see you uh, next Sunday. Bye.